Welcome to the next webinar in the Behavioral Health Integration Collaborative's Overcoming Obstacles series, Sustaining Behavioral Health Care in Your Practice. This webinar is titled, Addressing Behavioral Health in Primary Care, Non-Pharmacological Services and Treatments. Before we get started, please note that this webinar is for informational purposes only. You should consult a professional advisor for specific medical, legal, financial, or other advice. If you have any questions or concerns, please send your inquiries to practice.sustainability at ama-assn.org. This series is a collective product of eight of the nation's leading physician organizations dedicated to equipping physicians and their, and their practices with the necessary knowledge to sustain a whole person integrated and equitable approach to physical, mental, and behavioral health care during the COVID-19 pandemic and beyond. This webinar will cover how primary care practices can identify behavioral health needs within their patient population and administer non-pharmacological treatments in the primary care setting. And with that, I will turn the conversation over to Cone Health's pediatrician and University of North Carolina Chapel Hills adjunct professor, Dr. Shruti Simha, and University of Pennsylvania's professor of clinical medicine at the Raymond and Ruth Perlman School of Medicine in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, Dr. Jeffrey Yeager. Thank you, Linda, uh, for this introduction and for this opportunity. Um, I'm excited uh, for this presentation. Um, so I'm a pediatrician with um, the Tim and Carolyn uh, Rice Center. Uh, we're based in Greensboro um, and we're part of the Cone Health System. Uh, next. Um, so just a brief overview of um, our Rice Center clinic structure. We're a hospital affiliated clinic and we're part of the Cone Health Medical Group. We're a teaching site for UNC Chapel Hill medical students and uh, residents. We're also a continuity clinic site for primary care track residents. Um, our peer mix is uh, we don't have any Medicare as we're typically a pediatric practice. Uh, we have 88% Medicaid, so mostly an underserved population. Uh, we do see uh, some private patients, that's 5%, and the uninsured 7% are covered mostly by a sliding fee uh, that the Cone Health um, has structured. Next. Um, services, uh, we're a pediatric practice, so we do offer preventive services from birth to age 21. We have same-day visits for sick children and injured children. Of course, we do immunizations as we are pediatrics. Uh, we do have integrated behavioral health care, subspecialty care with developmental behavioral pediatrician and an adolescent medicine specialist. Uh, we have this Healthy Tomorrow Alliance, which is run by our adolescent clinic. Um, to reduce teen pregnancy rates and increase reproductive health education among teens in Greensboro. Uh, we're also a foster care medical home and provide the initial and comprehensive appointments for uh, children in foster care. Uh, we also have a refugee clinic um, and refugee families can be seen here together to establish care. And these are the newly arrived refugees. Next. Um, so we have, we're a pretty fairly large practice with 12 pediatricians, a general pe uh, pediatric nurse practitioner, DV specialist, an adolescent specialist who visits um, two adolescent nurse practitioners, a psychologist, three behavioral health clinicians, uh, and a part-time nutritionist. Um, we also have two parent educators who see the high-risk families for kids between zero to three, and they're funded by the zero to three um, program, which is a national nonprofit organization. Um, so several practices can actually um, access this, even if you're a private practice. Next. Um, so our clinic has two basic uh, behavioral health integrated models of care. Uh, the most used one is a primary care behavioral health model, which consists of the behavioral health providers. Uh, uh, as as clinical providers do warm handoffs to them, we all share one care plan through our electronic um, health system. Uh, the other model is a collaborative care model where we have a consulting psychiatrist from the Cone Health System. Um, uh, They're not part of our clinic essay, but they help other practices too. There's a behavioral health manager, 
uh, for the psychiatrist and there's a registry and our behavioral health clinicians in our clinic are the liaisons for the providers and the psychiatrist. Next. Uh, so the main components of our integrated behavioral health model, we have a healthcare team, which consists of um, our front office staff, the nurses, our CMAs, medical and behavioral health providers. We do universal screening as such where um, if any patient walks in for a well visit, they all are handed um, a screening questionnaire depending on their age and appropriate uh, screens. Um, so this helps with early identification and treatment of health issues. Um, warm handoff is a really important part of it where we try to access the behavioral health clinician during an appointment um, and they help provide evidence-based interventions. Uh, the collaborative model, which consists of the consulting psychiatrist where there's access to psychiatric recommendations. Next. Uh, so the role of the behavioral health clinician mostly is to work with patients and families, improve their habits and behaviors um, and emotions that are impacting their health and functions. Um, they work as a team to assist the patient and the family um, for success, to become successful uh, at targeting specific goals and problems. Um, and education and empowerment in the form of self-management skills. Next. Um, so what are the benefits of actually having a behavioral health clinician in clinic? Uh, the most important is decreased costly crisis management where patients may access the emergency room or the urgent care um, for problems that could have been taken care of in the clinic setting. Um, decreased work absences for patients and parents um, in cases where there are consolidated appointments. Um, say you have an appointment to see your um, PCP and there's also a joint appointment at the same time to see the behavioral clinician. Uh, reimbursements where you can bill for care coordination, therapeutic interventions and screens. So you can actually bill for the assessment tools that you're implementing during that visit. Um, increased access and completion of the referrals uh, when there is a warm handoff, we do see that uh, the patients actually will come for the appointment as they've actually seen a face um, to the behavioral health clinician or the counselor or therapist versus when there's a referral made and they actually don't know this person. So the chances of a no-show is much higher. Uh, there's of course increased patient and provider satisfaction. There's increased availability of uh, the providers for other uh, things like visits and phone calls if the behavioral clinician jumps in and helps with certain important issues. Next. Of course, um, every program has its challenges. And I think um, an important one is really educating the entire system, the providers, the staff, the patients about uh, this integrated behavioral health model and the role of the behavioral health clinician. Um, also normalizing the team access to these notes because traditionally, uh, mental health providers are pretty guarded about their uh, medical records. So I think uh, that had, was a challenge in the beginning. Um, and that has become easier with uh, not making these notes confidential to the PCPs who've made referrals. Um, documenting um, all these screening tools takes time and effort. So that's definitely a barrier. Uh, with adolescents, there's always the issue of confidentiality. Um, since we're all sharing um, the medical records. And of course, cost and reimbursement issues um, for having um, other staff members um, in the clinic. Next. Um, so typically, this is our workflow at our center. Like I mentioned before, when patients walk in for well visits or certain um, visits, they already are handed a screening tool depending on the visit. Um, so the medical provider will um, look at these assessment tools or identify a concern during the visit and ask the patient or the guardian if they're interested in a behavioral health uh, visit or a referral. If yes, um, we will try to do a warm handoff to the BHC if they're available. Uh, if they're not available, which could be many of the times because they're, all, they're busy seeing their own patients, uh, we schedule an appointment uh, with the BHC at another time. Um, at the same time, we also place an order for integrated behavioral health in the EHR. Uh, we use EPIC um, in our system, and so this is helpful for tracking and referral purposes. Um, once the BHC has seen the patient, probably the same day or another day, um, they, they complete a brief assessment or intervention as appropriate. 
They documented it in the same EHR, but as a separate account encounter. Um, and the options are they can schedule a follow-up assessment, they can connect the patient to a community mental health provider, or close a referral if the patient does not want or does not need another follow-up. Next. Um, I'm gonna just briefly go through their several assessment tools that we do, and some of them are like, ASQ, that's the ages and stages questionnaire, which is during a well visit, while others could be the ADHD or anxiety screens. Um, so here's a list that you can go through um, at your leisure. Next. Um, and some of the behavioral interventions used by us or the team are typically health promotions, using the assessment tools, psychoeducation, there could be motivational interviewing, behavioral activation, mindfulness, uh, the brief CBTs, or solution-focused therapies, and of course, parent education. Next. Just wanted to go through two uh, really common cases that we uh, come across in our clinic. Uh, typical adolescent visit, we see a 13-year-old, a patient has rapid weight gain, pre-diabetes, uh, and screens positive for most issues on the PHQ-9. Uh, at this time, the provider asks the patient if they would like to see the BHC and they contact the BHC and uh, do a warm handoff for some relaxation strategies. The patient, however, has more to say to the BHC, uh, says he has difficulty going to school, he's depressed, he's anxious about COVID, has had suicidal ideations in the past, but not actively suicidal. So the BHC um, has some time at that time, so does the patient, so they do a 20 minute brief intervention and schedules um, him for a follow-up. Also refers a patient for ongoing therapy elsewhere as this patient might need more um, intervention and uh, rounds back with the provider and discusses the case. Uh, next. Another very common case we see is um, well-child visits with babies, two-month-old uh, seen for a well visit, mom completes in Edinburgh and that's positive. Um, she has significant mood issues but has not talked to um, her OB about it. So the provider asks her and then contacts the BHC in clinic who's available for a warm handoff, luckily. BHC meets the mother and introduces herself um, and talks about available services. Uh, but the mom's too busy at that time to actually um, stay for the visit, but is willing to uh, come back for an appointment. Um, meanwhile, the behavioral health clinician um, does offer mom some community resources and information about support groups, which the mom is very grateful for. Um, and at the end of it, usually to um, complete the loop, the BHC discusses this plan with the provider. Um, and then we all share the EHR. Next. Um, so some really brief examples of interventions could be mindfulness that uh, we could do as providers or the BHC does it. Say there's anxiety about COVID, they discuss certain goals and it's mostly we cannot do anything about the pandemic other than of course um, the three M's and um, getting vaccinated, but you could focus on your senses at this time, um, do some mindfulness practices in your house, or uh, there's some worksheets that we provide the patients during the visit or for them to do at home, um, keeping it really simple and enjoying, um, say, a meal. Um, so talking to them about really simple interventions is helpful. Next. Um, some other interventions that we could possibly do is like, common sleep issues. So we talk about sleep hygiene. If it's attention seeking behaviors in uh, little kids, we do positive parenting skills. Uh, for school problems with kids, we assess for the issues and then we can make referrals to the school. Uh, we can administer tools or make a follow-up appointment or help um, kids, parents, or teenagers with some mindfulness practices. Next. Well, the million dollar question. So how do you pay for these integrated services? Next. There are several codes that I'm gonna leave uh, in this presentation that you could look at. So there are general BHI services for Medicaid, uh, Medicare only and care management services, minimum 20 minutes. Uh, there's psychotherapy billing codes. An important thing is that it has to be at least 16 minutes or more for a behavioral health clinician to be in the room to do a brief intervention. Uh, if it's less than that, then it's not reimbursable. So uh, many times they do a really short visit with a warm handoff if they don't have 16 minutes or more and then schedule another visit or they at least try the visit to be for more than 16 minutes 
for the brief intervention so they can actually code for this visit. Um, and we don't need any comprehensive clinical assessments um, uh, until the seventh visit. So typically we try to do five to six visits and then we um, hand them off to outside providers. Next. Um, so these are some collaborative care service um, codes, which typically the psychiatrist will code for. So we as PCPs don't use that. Uh, next. Um, so key takeaways uh, is incorporating behavioral health services in primary care settings definitely adds value to care, uh, increases patient and provider satisfaction because value-based medicine is our future. Uh, providers save valuable time in clinic settings when they're able to consult and refer to VHC for further assessment, assessment and intervention. These VHC visits are reimbursable. Uh, integrated behavioral health reduces stigma uh, of accessing mental health services. Um, and there's definitely a need to build system-wide consensus about these collaborative services and also advocate for reimbursement from insurance companies. Next. And that's about it. Thank you so much for this opportunity. I do want to mention our lead behavioral health clinician, Jasmine Williams, who helped me with this presentation and also um, uh, let me borrow some of her slides. Um, she does a lot of collaborative work in our community and um, Cone Health System. Thank you once again. Hello and thank you, uh, Dr. Simha, and um, to my colleagues for the opportunity to talk about our um, non-pharmacological interventions in behavioral health uh, at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, as I said, I'm a professor of clinical medicine at the uh, University of Pennsylvania here in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Next slide. Um, our practice is an adult-only practice, 18 and up. Uh, we have about one-third Medicare, one-third Medicaid, and one-third private pay. We're an academic practice of 11 physicians, four nurse practitioners, and about 50 uh, medical residents who use us as their primary care site. I'll start our conversation about our um, behavioral health integration program with a case. This is a patient of mine who is a 50-year-old male with a history of a clo closed head injury as a young adult. He'd had subsequent volatility and executive function disorder and had been on long-term high-dose benzodiazepines that had been tapered successfully over time. When I last saw him, he was on an SSRI for mood, but he had stopped that on his own and presented back to primary care after a long ICU stay for sepsis that had been complicated by alcohol withdrawal. He was in Alcoholics Anonymous, but still very depressed and was lashing out verbally at his family and had come for help. He was not interested in another trial of SSRIs and not interested in, in his words, seeing a shrink. So the question was, what could I offer him? Next slide, please. So this gives me an opportunity to talk about the three elements of our Penn Behavioral Health uh, Collaborative Care Behavioral Health Program. Um, there are three elements, as I said, to our program. The first is an intake and triage protocol. The second is um, an on-site behavioral health specialist and uh, e-consult to psychiatry is the third leg of the, uh, of the um, behavioral health integration stool. It was crafted in partnership with our electronic health record staff and the billing and coding experts here at Penn to make use of the collaborative care billing codes that had been introduced by Medicare prior to the initiation of our program. Uh, for those of you not um, familiar with these codes, these codes allow for billing at the end of each calendar month based on the total minutes of face-to-face -face time plus collaborative care between the primary care provider and behavioral health specialist, as well as the primary care provider and the psychiatry consultant. Initially, these codes were accepted by Medicare, but they've been since negotiated with nearly all the other insurers in our market. Next slide, please. So the intake and triage protocol is really the first important step. Um, when they speak to a patient, they perform an approximately 20 minute assessment that is standardized and includes evidence-based screening tools and are done by offsite staff who are uh, trained in the use of these screening tools for, and it is used for all patients regardless of insurance. The patients can call to arrange this uh, screening by themselves or if the patients do not call to the uh, provided phone number, uh, the staff on the um, intake and triage line will call the patients themselves. Importantly, there is screening for suicidality uh, with protocols in place for a warm handoff to behavioral health providers for any positive or questionable answers regarding suicidality. And all of the screening algorithms end with either a referral to specialty mental health care, which refers to 
uh, psychiatry, but also to addiction treatment programs or intensive outpatient programs. Counseling in the community or our on-site behavioral health specialist. And where you land in this algorithm is really determined by the results of the assessment, but also uh, for better or for worse by an assessment of your insurance status, status as not all the insurers cover our on-site care. Next slide, please. So these are the results of the intake for my patient MK. The intake call was completed within five days of me placing the order for uh, collaborative care behavioral health. And you can see uh, a screenshot in our medical record of just some of what the intake looks like. They screen for uh, drug abuse, they'll screen for uh, psychopharmacology issues, uh, mania, psychosis, and a variety of other uh, mental health issues. Uh, similar to what Dr. Simha had referred to. This patient had a PHQ-9 of 11, a GAD-7, or uh, assessment of anxiety of about 13, and a PCL-5, which is a screen for post-traumatic stress disorder of 8, which is pretty low. And he was determined to have mild to moderate anxiety um, associated with depression. Uh, and it was recommended for him to have in-office care with our behavioral health specialist. Next slide, please. So the second element of our protocol is these uh, in-office behavioral health specialists. We chose to hire licensed clinical social workers for this, and they are trained and supervised through our primary care service line, as well as Penn Psychiatry. These specialists have weekly meetings with supervising psychiatrists, and the care, importantly, is provided in episodes, intended to be um, in the range of 12 weeks to six months um, maximum. The care is collaborative by design. Our behavioral health specialists are in our practices and they circulate throughout the practice through the day as would any provider for ad hoc conversations as well as some structured conversations um, when necessary. And we've had these licensed clinical social workers attend our provider meetings with the physicians and nurse practitioners in the practice. The issues that are referred to the BHS are generally low level short-term issues, for example, modest, uh, moderate anxiety, adjustment disorders, grief reactions, mild to moderate depression, mild alcohol use disorder, and insomnia. Importantly, anybody who screens positive for thought disorders, including schizophrenia, severe depression, bipolar disorder, or any moderate to severe substance use disorders are referred to offsite services. Next slide. So returning to my patient, he worked closely with our in-office behavioral health specialist, uh, during COVID, this was done virtually, but in the uh, past few months, this is reverted back to in-person, which is great. The treatment really focused on his excessive worry that was identified during their conversations, and we use tools of cognitive behavioral therapy uh, in which our BHS is trained. The episode was nearing the close, but the patient's wife expressed to me that there was some concern about backsliding and said maybe it was time to consider medication or a referral to a psychiatrist. The patient himself said he thought a referral to a psychiatrist closer to his home would be great. So I reordered a triage call and he underwent a separate um, um, revisit with our triage system for referral to uh, a psychiatrist. But he also said he would be interested in trial of medication. And at that time, I e-consulted psychiatry. Next slide. So the third element of our protocol is um, a psychiatrist on staff who is supported by our um, CCBH program. Penn Psychiatry allocates 0.1 full-time equivalent psychiatrist for every one behavioral health specialist to answer our questions about management. And also that is uh, supporting the weekly consultation that I mentioned with the behavioral health specialist. The usual questions we use for these e-consults are when to switch from counseling alone to counseling plus psychiatry, or when to switch from counseling alone to counseling plus medications. We will also use these specialists for any patient, not just those patients who are in counseling, when we have any questions about medication choice, for example, choosing an SSRI when someone has not done well on a previous SSRI. Um, and we'll also ask about medication dosing when we have questions about that. They are committed to turning this around within 24 business hours, and their notes, importantly, are part of our official medical records. So they are there for all providers uh, and members of the care team to see and provides us some backup um, medical legally when the patient uh, asks about um, how their care is being provided. Next slide. 
So for my patient, psychiatry reviewed the patient's chart, including past medication trials that had been used in his care. The psychiatrist suggested a trial of Wellbutrin and offered advice about dosing. The psychiatrist also noted that sleep had been an issue for the patient recently and recommended short-term medications for sleep while we were increasing the medications. And the patient, thankfully, was eventually connected to a psychiatrist in his community where he has done generally pretty well. Next slide. So what works about our protocol? Importantly, uh, our, our mental health providers, our behavioral health specialists are on site in our office and they are integrated with our practice and the care is truly collaborative. This provides the ability, availability for warm handoffs as well as curbside consults with the behavioral health specialist. It has bypassed our regional shortage of mental health providers, which I know is not simply a regional issue, but is truly a national crisis. And importantly, when the BHS has a full roster of patients, which happened by about three months, the use of the collaborative care codes uh, made it such that the pro program has been able to pay for itself, especially now that the care is covered by most of our insurers. Our practice had integrated standards for depression screening and anxiety screening, and this protocol of having an on-site mental health professional has really supported those standards as we can now provide an answer to our colleagues and our trainees about what to do when a patient screens positive. And having a provider on-site has really helped reduce the stigma that's associated with mental health care. Next slide. Challenges. As you can tell from some of what I have indicated, this was not an inexpensive program to set up, requiring collaboration with our mental health professionals, as well as our Department of Psychiatry and um, our um, electronic medical record system. Space has been an ongoing issue as the provision of an on-site behavioral health provider requires them, uh, that person to have an office. And uh, the rollout setup and continuation has relied heavily on resources that I know are not necessarily available to all, especially in um, smaller, more independent practices. For example, a cooperative department of psychiatry and a skilled group of billing and IT folks who are able to help us set this up. And as I've indicated, the EHR build for um, visit types that would uh, facilitate the collaborative care codes and the monthly billing was a heavy lift, but I'm, I'm happy to say that uh, this has been working for several years as it now stands. Next slide. What I wish I knew at the outset, well, um, demand will be greater than anyone imagines. We have had um, uh, requests um, from the very beginning for mental health care on site that has really outstripped our capacity and it's taken us a while to scale it up. It's important to build in the understanding with your team that integrated mental health care would have to be delivered in time limited episodes really to accommodate the demand. These providers cannot simply accumulate patients that they keep for years and years. Our behavioral health providers have had uh, turnover that um, is important to know that um, one to two years has been the standard in this position. And it's important to build time into their schedule as well as your provider schedule for the collaborative care. And again, to reiterate, the electronic health record build has been critical and it's important to partner with those folks early to facilitate use of the codes that eventually supported this. Next slide. I wanna thank my collaborators here at Penn, including Drs. Matt Press and Cecilia Livesey and Eleanor Anderson, as well as Administrator Sebastian Haynes and our lead licensed clinical social worker, Amanda Thompson, for their help, help in preparing this presentation. Next slide. I'll leave you with two websites that have been critical to us in setting up our behavioral health care, um, both with uh, psychiatry.org and the University of Washington Ames Protocol in setting up teams and assuring that the payment structures are in place. And with that, I will hand it back to Linda to finish us up and, um, and wrap things up. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Simha and, um, and Jaeger for sharing your expertise and experiences with our viewers. Be sure to visit our series page on the AMA website for more information on upcoming releases. You can also access previous recordings on our YouTube playlist. Please also check out the Collaborative's Behavioral Health Integration Compendium for a helpful framework on how you can make behavioral health integration effective in your practice, along with other actionable resources and practice case studies. Lastly, 
Access the AMA's practice how-to guides on the AMA's website for implementing specific aspects of effective behavioral health integration. This includes pharmacological treatment, substance use disorder, suicide prevention, and workflow design. Thank you for joining us today.